Hello everyone. Um, uh, I want to say uh, welcome and, and thanks for joining me. Um, in this video, as well as in the video series that we're going to create kind of with this, um, I'm going to go over some features of the RS Logix 500 programming and and some of its its features as well as how to program as well as maybe giving you kind of a couple of sample projects here along the way. So to go ahead and get started, I've already installed and downloaded RS Logix 500. Um, I've downloaded the free version. Um, if you you yourself want to download that and install that and at least uh, give that a try, I would uh, strongly encourage you to kind of look that up on the internet. Um, there's a couple other folks out there that are really good in the automation side of things and they'll give you a great step-by-step uh, -step walkthrough on how to download that as well as um, some other forums that exist out there um, and that they'll give you the walkthrough on how to install it without having to worry about the serial numbers and all that information. The down part to the RS Logix 500 that is the free edition. It's only good for the old school Micrologix equipment such as the 1000 series um, Micrologix controllers. If you're looking to work with the 1400s, you'll have to go ahead and, and pay for the the subscription or or the perpetual license from um, whomever your Allen Bradley Rockwell dealer is. As for that being said, for the most part, most of the features are going to be similar or at least close to the same on the RS Logix 500 free edition. There are going to be some features that we will notice that we don't have access to, and that's. That's due to the different upgrades that um, Rockwell has released for the RS Logix 500 software over the years. Um, it's still supported today. However, um, some of the features, they're no longer building new stuff for it. Um, they're just adding maybe a patch here and there, depending on what kind of security that we're running into with Windows. It's, it's just a support kind of thing at this point. Um, so I've already opened it up. And so here it is. And when you go to open the page, this is exactly what you're going to see. It's just a blank page, and it's going to expect you to decide what you need to do with it. Um, we're going to go ahead and have to create a new project. So you could either click the new project file icon, or you could go file new. Um, you can also use the quick key of control N if you wanted to. And again, like I said, the free edition only supports the 1000 up to 1100 series. Um, and in our case, I'm just going to run it directly with a 1000, and I'm going to go ahead and leave my processor named it untitled. Um, really doesn't matter in my particular situation. If you were building a new project on a factory floor or something along those lines, you might want to name the process or something particular. Um, you can also come over here and set up your communication settings, or you can do that later on in your little comms tab up over here in the, the main ribbon up above. Um, my personal preference is to set it from the comms tab up here in the upper ribbon. Um, I know some people prefer to do it here. It's entirely up to you. You can also click the Who Active and do the same thing that you would do in the comms tab. It'd pull up RS links and, and walk you through that. In our case, we're just going to go ahead and leave it as it, it doesn't know what's going on. And I'm just going to select the Micrologix 1000 series and I'm going to click OK. So now it's created it. It's automatically created the file as I would need it. It's giving me the the basic set of ladders that I'm going to be able to use and need. Excuse me. Um, it's labeled the project process or untitled, leaving the name untitled. Um, I'm going to kind of walk through this project tree a little bit for us so we kind of have a basic understanding. If you wanted to change some of that information, you could go into the controller properties tab um, under the controller file folder you could change the processor name once again um, if you needed to change the processor type for any reason you could change the processor in here um, if you wanted to set passwords and lock stuff you could do that here in the passwords file um, once again if you wanted to set your configurations for some communication the links you could do that under the controller communications in most cases, the only reason why I would use the controller properties is to change the processor type or change the processor name. Um, processor status. Now this is kind of important and critical to those that are doing a lot more troubleshooting out on maybe a factory floor or wherever that might be. Um, you'd need to know some of your, maybe your scan time of how fast you're scanning. Um, in our case, everything's out at zero because we've not actually put this into a processor yet. 
if you had maybe a, an overflow type of issue or you wanted to set an overflow trap because your math is adding up beyond the 32,000 X number that um, RS Logix 500 supports, you would catch that here. Um, it continues to go through this. You might have to check your errors file. Um, just kind of depends on what you're looking for in your status, but that's generally what you're going to find in your your processor status tab that's underneath your controller folder. I/O configuration. If we were using, let's say, I believe it's a 1747 processor series that uses a, a chassis or a rack, if you will, um, you might have different pieces that are within the I/O configuration. In our case, because it's a MicroLogix, generally we're not going to have that. Now again, that's not to say into the 1200 series and the 1400 series and some of those, we did start to get modules that we could add onto the side. And in those cases, we might add um, a particular um, I/O. But in our case here, we're not we're not doing that. Um, channel configuration. So because we only have the DF1 communications on a MicroLogix 1000. Um, we don't have any communication set up. Now, if we, again, if we'd had like a 1747 on a slick 505, we'd have Ethernet, um, I believe RS-232, and I think there's one other port that I'm kind of drawing a blank on at this moment. And we'd have the opportunity to go in and set like our IP address or some other information. But since we don't have that, um, our channel configuration is kind of left blank, except for what our, our baud rate speed would be. And we have the opportunity to change our baud rate depending on our particular criteria or need. The next thing we spend a lot of time in is is probably our program files. So you have your different ladder setups here. Um, you have the opportunity to have multiple ladders depending on what you would need. Um, and I'll, we'll kind of walk through that a little bit more down in the program here. Um, one of the things that really set 500 apart from 5000, either Ars Logix 5000 or Studio 5000, is the data files. So the data files were automatically created for us depending on what our information was that we created um, in our I.O. configuration. Um, so again, if you had a chassis, it went ahead and created all of that stuff automatically for you. You couldn't deviate um, from what the data files created for us. You could add, you could continue to add and grow up. So, like for instance, in, if we open up our binary folder, our binary is going to stop after 31, um, and I believe that's a standard probably for the micro logics. But it, it, when we get into like the 505 processor again, we could continue adding on beyond that and and have more binary bits. Um, so we have the opportunity to do that. But in general. And generally speaking, our data files and everything are already set based on the inputs and outputs that we have set in the I.O. configuration. And the only thing we have the opportunity to change is maybe like a name of the tag. The tag itself is set. We can't we can't go in. So it'll always be a B3 X number of whatever it is. And that's that's set. There's no tag creation like we see in Studio 5000 or any type like that. Um, the other one that we are kind of missing in our data file, so is going to be the, I believe it's an F8, which should be a float. I can tell you it's an 8, and I, I do believe it's an F, but um, it's a float bit. And so, like any reel that we would have that would have more than a a, a standard integer of anything that doesn't carry a decimal that would be in our our float file. But anything beyond that, we have to um, account for that in the, in our float. So in the case of this particular controller we won't be able to carry a decimal place on a MicroLogix 1000 we'll only be able to carry it as a standard number. So let me quickly walk through this so O0 or outputs those are going to be all your outputs from your controller. Um, I1 those are your inputs those are anything that's a physical input. Um, status is your your um, controller or processor status that we just went ahead and talked about here a little bit ago. B3 is your binary, so that's your Boolean bits. So it's either on or off. Uh, timers are your T4, so anything that's timer retentive, timer on, timer off, those kinds of things are always going to be your timer bits. Counters, count up, count down, those are your timers, or excuse me, counters. And then R6 control, that's generally used in a sequencing function. So when we step positions through a sequencer that'll be in the R6 control. 
and then N7 is your integer. So exactly like it would be in Studio 5000, it's an integer, double integer, um, and then single integer file. It, the same process there as well. Um, force files, those are generally where the processor would store your force. So if you go in and force an input or an output on or off, it's going to store it so that we can see it in our, our force files when we open it up. And what it would do is it would put like an X right here on where 6 is. So if we did output 6 right here, it would put an X in that slot saying that we'd force that, that position on. The only other thing that we maybe kind of talk about here down below the project tree is probably trends and without having any information here we can't really go into trending too much so that that's for a definitely a later video. Um, that kind of concludes everything that I wanted to get through in this video as for what's going on in the project tree. Um, stay tuned to the next video and that's where we'll talk a little bit more about um, basic programming concepts and basic programming um, information. So thank you for watching and stay tuned.